hold hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Guys. Welcome to the Ghost Story Guys. I'm Brennan Store. I'm Ian Gibbs. And this is a show where we talk about spooks, specters, and all the other things watching us from the shadows beyond the campfire. Some conversations only make sense after the sun is set, and this is most definitely one. Thanks for tuning in. It's Tuesday, October 17th. This is episode 19, and we're coming to you from that tiny mountain cabin you dream about but can never quite reach. How you doing, Ian? I'm doing pretty good, Brennan. It's getting busy. It's getting packed with ghostly Halloween adventure, but otherwise, I'm good. Excellent. <laughs> good to be busy. That's what they tell me. <laughs> and how are you doing? I am the opposite of that, oh, actually. Oh, yeah, no. I uh, working, going to the gym, getting high, and watching Hannibal. Oh, uh, that's that's I'm great. A simple man. So you're like 19. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I'm getting custom shoes made. That's exciting. Custom shoes? Are you like a mafia don? I have wide feet, and it is difficult <laughs> to find shoes that fit me. <laughs> I went through like six or seven stores in Vancouver, found nothing that even came even close to fitting. Actually, in desperation, I walked into this one fancy place. And I said to the guy, I'm willing to spend up to 400 bucks, thinking that this was a big deal. Right. And he says, we should have something in that range. <laughs> and then I saw what looked like a turquoise boat shoe for $800, Ooh. and I realized I was punching way above my weight. Whoa. What did you do? Well, thankfully, none of the dainty little princess slippers he had uh, <laughs> came in clodhopper size. <laughs> so I was able to leave without having to admit that most of his inventory costs more than my car. Yeah, he knew. They can smell poverty on us. <laughs> it smells like vegetable soup. <laughs> I do like soup. <laughs> Not vegetable soup, but I like soup. There used to be this place in town that did incredible soup. Uh, Lully's, it was called. It was on Broughton across from the, the library there. But the guy, man, the, the guy was kind of a dick, but he made this fantastic split pea and ham soup. <laughs> And this one creamy potato style thing. Oh, man. I mean, the sandwiches were fine, but the soup was incredible. We went from shoes to food. Like, what is this, sex in the city? <laughs> That's such a Samantha thing to say. Oh, God. <laughs> you know, I just started watching that show. I've never seen it before. No. Yeah. I, and, it's kind of fun. Oh. <laughs> I, I never understood what the big deal was when it was on and the movies came out and there's all this. But you know what? If you take away the shoes and the whining, it's actually got some good storylines. I, I'm i actually at a loss for words. I, <laughs> I, I, I got nothing. <laughs> I, you, you hate that show, don't you? With the fire of a thousand suns. <laughs> Lord. Oh, that's funny. Anyways, we have a guest on today's show. Let's talk about him instead. Poor guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that for an intro. Uh, he is a Vancouver Island author who wrote a book about the strange stories of this area called, fittingly, The Haunting. Of Vancouver Island. Ooh. I know. His name is Shannon Sin, and we'll be talking to him right after the break. So we will be right back. Welcome back to the Ghost Story, guys. I'm here today with Shannon Sin, author of The Haunting of Vancouver Island. Shannon is a researcher who approaches folklore and hauntings from a journalistic perspective. He's also an infantry veteran, photographer, and stand-up paddleboarder. Shannon, thanks so much for coming on the Ghost Story, guys, man. Thanks for having me. So I, I really enjoyed your book, I got to say, and I really appreciated the level of detail in it. And of course, the book is a, a collection of stories from Vancouver Island, which is, of course, on the west coast of Canada. Uh, but what I found fascinating about it is it goes from uh, Victoria. And of course, you know, Ian has Victoria's Most Haunted, and there are uh, quite a few ghost books from this area. Uh, but then it goes further north. And of course, it's it covers parts of the island which have I don't think ever really been covered in a in a in a major book. So it, it's sort of a fascinating look at stories that tend not to get told. How is it you decided to write the book? Well, first of all, thank you for the compliment. I really appreciate it. It kind of was a gradual process that happened over a period of many years. 
I had an experience myself in the late 90s on Kia Beach on the west coast of, of Vancouver Island and have always been a writer, always had a blog. And what, when I was living back on Vancouver Island and I was uh, out of the military, I had done a post about different places on Vancouver Island being haunted, kind of like a list. And it was really popular. I realized then that there has never been a book just on Vancouver Island. I'd also been a researcher for the Nanaimo Museum, so I had helped with the ghost tours they've done here. And a lot of historical research as well. Like I said, the oldest story in the book, uh, the Kia Beach story, was almost 20 years ago. So in some ways, I've been uh, working on this book for that long. Wow. So would you mind sharing the Kia Beach story with us? I had actually never even heard of Kia Beach, and I've been living on the island for 10 years. So I, I think our listeners would be very curious to, to know about the place and your experiences there, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, Kia Beach is near Banfield. It's usually about a two-hour hike from Banfield. There was a lot of talk about the place being very spiritual and people having spiritual connections and such there. So I had an opportunity to go with a couple of my friends there and fell in love with the place. So I ended up, I was, it was kind of a, a rougher patch of my life at the time. Didn't really have a good job and uh, I was just kind of really at the end of my ropes. There was a, my grandfather was, had terminal cancer, he was dying and stuff. And I kind of felt like I needed to figure out my life. I almost felt like the, the place was calling me back as a good place to go and meditate and clear my head. So I ended up camping there for 17 days. And the beach is a very long sand beach, and it's kind of in a crescent shape. And at one end of the beach is sea caves, at the other end of the beach is sea arches. And it's a whale rubbing beach, so a lot of times whales come in and such. Really, really peaceful to somebody like me. It does kind of have a f spiritual feeling to it. I'm not sure off the top of my head how many days I was, I was in. I, I, it's probably in my book because I had to go back and look at my journal notes to make sure everything was correct. Right. But I think it was around 13 days in or something. I'd had several experiences, and I talk about it a bit, as far as like feeling like I wasn't alone or feeling really connected. And I woke up one evening, and it felt like somebody was outside of the shelter that I'd built. I went outside, and there was nobody there. But I noticed that there was a light in the trees kind of hovering up by uh, the cliffs or above the cliffs. And I watched it for a long time. I didn't really feel anything eerie about it, uh, but it did seem really odd. And the trees are kind of too thick for it to be in the air on the other side of the trees. The next day, being kind of the curious person I am and always trying to find answers, I climbed up there and explored this whole area. And it was all kind of really heavy salal underbrush, almost impossible to walk through. And I really had to conclude that there was no way that somebody could have been up there, especially at night. And I believe that I would have been able to hear them from where I was as well. And the light would have had to have been kind of uh, further up than one would expect. So it was uh, uh, quite an interesting experience because it was uh, something I couldn't couldn't really explain. It's a place that still feels, I still feel a connection to, to this day. And uh, in some ways, I feel like that was the seed that was initially planted uh, that would be, eventually become this book. Right. So that was, you view that as kind of a transformative period in your life. Absolutely. Yeah. I was more or less, I guess a person could say living on the side of the road with my thumb out in the air. Like I, I didn't really have uh, much direction in my life. My grandfather was really close to him. He was a really hard worker and a uh, very stoic man. And something about him dying really instilled in me a sense that it was time to grow up and get direction. Uh, when I went and was on the beach, I, uh, I s still had long hair. And after this period, I cut off my hair. And within a year, I started in what would become my career that would eventually lead me into the, also into the military and such. So yeah, it was very transformative time. It's important to also state that I wasn't using any drugs or I wasn't drinking or anything when I when this happened. It just right. uh, it was just as real as anything. Since we're uh, we're talking about Port Alberni, which is roughly three hours north of Victoria, I'm curious about another story you had from that area. It's the woman who walks on water. Would you mind telling us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's helped a lot with that story. Uh, I talk about her in, in the book. Her name's uh, Nelda Jackson. She'd uh, reached out to me on my blog and commented about the story. And then uh, she'd left comments on another forum as well and kind of started me on kind of the search for what was going on with the story as well as being able to verify it because I, I was able to find that other people were and familiar with the story as well. And interestingly enough, I've since the book has been edited and everything, I've even met other people who have told me this story uh, as well. So it's a very well-known story in Port Alberni. And basically, it's a woman that is seen, a First Nations woman, but she's never described in traditional dress. So she's more... Um, I guess in contemporary, like old fashioned dress is the way I understand it. Interesting. And they say that she walks on the water and she'll actually speak to people and say, have you seen my baby? And that's very, as you know, that's very unusual in the ghost world for uh, spirits to actually communicate and speak out loud. So I, I found that really interesting. And then when I was researching it, just trying to find out like who this could be, if there was any deaths or, or murders or anything in that area. Um, just fascinating. I kind of include some of the research in the book, although nothing's confirmed as far as who she could be. Interesting. So we, we don't know who or what. It just seems to be a, a sort of a repeating phantom. Yeah. And there's different different stories about her. Like she won't just be seen on the water. Like she's followed people up the path. She's been seen by one woman coming out of the water but completely dry looking during day during the daytime oh wow so, so even in the daytime even in the daytime yeah and i do uh, include that description in the book as well the thing i like about stories like that is it's not super well known and the details when the details seem kind of chaotic or they don't they don't really match up it, in a sense uh, they, it feels more authentic to me. It feels more like people might actually be having an experience. But like I'm clear in in the book that I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that ghosts are spirits of the dead. That's something I really appreciated about your book was your willingness to to do the research and to go through and say, you know what, this doesn't match up. And I, I think that goes a long way towards helping us make some kind of sense of this. Because I think you're right. I think it's not always, or who knows, it may not ever be the spirits of the dead. You know, I think we we default to that explanation because it makes sense within the, w at least one of the models of the world we've devised. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that there was kind of a an effort to record stories, uh, oral histories, probably an honest effort until the last maybe couple of decades where it became more and more kind of the books became more and more kind of like children's stories and the reality TV shows kind of proposed these mainstream ideas of like, this is a ghost. This is how you capture them. This is what's going on. I'm always very suspicious of anybody that says that they know what ghosts are or they can tell what what's happening or, or what this spirit is, is asking for. So while I'm a believer in one sense, I'm also a hardcore skeptic at the same time. I really appreciated how you managed to sort of clear the air on the subject of Forbidden Plateau. Forbidden Plateau is the big story for the Courtney Comox Cumberland area. Right. Uh, like it's uh, it's one of the, the huge stories that's known uh, off of Vancouver Island. So I, I needed to include it. And it's the biggest story in that area where, you know, like honestly, that whole area has so many um, cool ghost stories. But that's the big one. That's the the big kind of otherworldly supernatural story is that it's an area that used to be a ski area and it's still used for hiking and stuff. Uh, there's been a lot of stories told about it, a lot of uh, people going mad and uh, disappearances and, and such and claims of sightings and all sorts of things. So it was a fun uh, chapter to research. And uh, really there's a woman up in the Courtney Museum. Her name's in the book, but I think her name's uh, Ruth masters but she has collected a bunch of the stories and put it in a binder together and, and that kind of was a really good place for me to find a lot of a lot of the stories as a groundwork and to work around right now was it her take that the stories or a lot of the historical stories at least were created for the purpose of tourism is that correct yes so she's the first person that i heard say that 
and I was able to verify that that's true. But that being said, there are a lot of stories that from that area that don't make sense and that are kind of really eerie as well. I mean, you, you go into the first, you kind of lean more towards into the First Nation stories, and there's, you know, these types of spirit beings or, or whatever you want to call them all over the island in all of our wild places. So it's not just this place called Forbidden Plateau that is really just a made-up section on a map created by settlers. There's stories that happen in that area, and there's stories that happen outside of that area that are really kind of strange. You have a great chapter in the book on Sasquatch, wild men of the woods, things like this. And I actually didn't realize that we had such a concentration of Sasquatch sightings here on the island. Can you tell us a little bit about the sort of the Sasquatch culture here and the maybe the various things people have seen? Sure. The idea of Sasquatch, the the term is kind of actually uh, it's believed that it came from the Coast Salish on Vancouver Island. There has been a lot of sightings that people have described similar creatures all over the island, and this predates settlers being here. There's I, I include in the book some early examples. And then uh, we've got, uh, like you said, a huge concentration of sightings here, like Monster Quest did a whole episode on Vancouver Island called uh, Ape Island. Because of all these sightings and such, there's a wildlife biologist on Vancouver Island, lives in the Comox area, Dr. Binder Ningle. And he moved here in the 70s to specifically to study Sasquatch. And he has a couple books out. They're really fascinating because he comes from the position that we're in the process of scientific discovery of this creature. There's also another gentleman, Thomas Seaweed. It's, uh, he's from Alert Bay. He's Kwakwakiwak background. And he kind of fuses the, uh, these ideas of the Sasquatch, kind of the uh, Dr. Binder Nagel's cryptozoology approach with the First Nations lore that he, his background, which is really fascinating. And um, I'm really interested in the First Nations stories because they're quite, they're actually, when you get into them, they're not like a lot of the cryptozoology kind of crowd or the mainstream kind of ideas. They're like, oh, look at all these First Nations stories that they believe in what we believe in. But you start looking at the stories and that's not true at all. They're like, for example, in the Kwakwakiwaka by Alert Bay area and like kind of north of Campbell River, which is pretty much the whole northern part of the island because Campbell River is only halfway, even though we call it the North Island. Their story is of Zunaqua, which is a giantess or ogress, and she's been known to uh, be very beneficial and often in many stories, but she will kind of as a boogeyman type story, she'll steal children and put them in her basket and potentially eat them. Well, these stories are, Zunikwa is very clearly female, and she's described similar to a Sasquatch, I guess you could say, but she's 100% female. Her husband is uh, Bookmas, uh, uh, I'm hoping I said that right, but he is the king of the ghosts, and he's only three feet tall. Interesting. He's uh, described monkey-like as well. So there's, like a lot of the cryptozoology, like they're, they're pointing and they're saying, yeah, these stories all match ours, but really they're very clearly saying that this is a spirit being, it's a supernatural being, and that's why it can't be detected. That's why there'll never be a body. There'll never be any physical evidence. But, you know, there's so many compelling sightings and there's so many eyewitness kind of testimony. And, uh, you know, the Alert Bay, there was a couple of years ago, there was... Uh, a rash of sightings on this island that Alert Bay is on, and there's no wildlife on the island. And so this idea that there's this elusive man-ape that's going to swim to this island, it's virtually just a village, you know, a bunch of trees. And the sightings all took place outside of the big house, which is uh, their religious kind of central building, and in the cemetery. And uh, somebody captured the howling, and that was shared on the news. So uh, quite different when you start looking at these stories than than um, that's proposed by cryptozoologists. And 
And then you start looking, there's the three main groups on Vancouver Island, First Nations group, the Kwakwakiwak, the Nochilmouth, and the Coast Salish, and they all share similar stories. They're not saying at all that this is uh, something that's natural. You know, a lot of people that make these claims will automatically say that they have a feeling of, of something otherworldly, like they're, they're filled with terror. Whatever people are claiming to experience isn't the same thing as an animal that isn't discovered. And then that's not even touching on the topic of, uh, you know, the a breeding population that would be necessary. And the fact that there's so many dashboard cameras, there's uh, drones, there's field cameras everywhere that people use to study our wildlife. Like there's, you know, estimates of how many exact wolves are on this island and you know, no, no matter, like, it's a thick forest in many places, but they know, like, people know. And the idea that there's vast expanses of unexplored wilderness, people have gone zigzagged across this whole island looking for natural resources to exploit. So there's uh, there's something, uh, I, I believe, uh, something that's not, it's not really the cryptozoology kind of approach, although I could be wrong. I just think that Whatever people are experiencing, whether, again, whether it's like some sort of sound hallucination or whether it is something from another dimension, because some people believe in other dimensions, or you get into like religious or philosophical ideas. I just think that for us to just automatically everybody just be so conformist about their ideas and just be like, oh, you know, this, this, there's this TV show and there's this movie back however long ago that's pretty much been repeatedly picked apart as a fake um, but we're all going to believe in this creature now. And uh, so just to jump in, know, that's think... the Patterson Gimlin film you're referring to. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it's, there's been types of encounters like this all throughout history. Like we always, uh, it's the very mainstream Judaic kind of Christian idea that anything outside of biblical belief is impossible. And the people that lived hundreds of years ago were completely ignorant and stupid. So it couldn't possibly, when they saw uh, the things that they said they saw, giants, which, you know, what's the difference between a giant and a Sasquatch? Or, uh, you know, dragons, uh, now we see sea serpents, whatever. It's just like there's this idea that because they lived back then, they were, you know, completely out to lunch and that we're modern and scientific and even though people are still having similar experiences that that they made up everything in the past and now we're uh, in a position that that uh, you know we're trying to say okay these x x amount of stories are are completely made up and then these other ones are like oh there must be undiscovered creatures i just think that that there's uh, possibly they they're completely the same sort of experience as ghosts and uh uh, people ha experiencing hauntings and such. And, and I, I tend to agree. Uh, you tell me the story of uh, Book Miss. Uh, again, I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but there was, uh, reminds me of a story I just heard on another show where a woman who sees what she believes are the fae or fairies, I believe she lived in Kentucky, and she described seeing a female uh, fairy or whatever you want to call it, and then a much smaller male who appeared to be doing her bidding. And I think it's a fascinating parallel. You've got this you know, First Nation story that you've described, and now you've got a, a parallel with someone who's seeing a thing down in, you know, way far away in the southern United States. And it really, I think, points to, a, a, as you say, a, a non-physical explanation. And I really encourage everyone to pick up the book. It's There are a lot of great stories, a lot of great history, and again, things you're just not going to find anywhere. Places like the Harriet Bay Inn and other places in and around Campbell River and Quadra Island, it's all really fascinating stuff. And that book, again, is The Haunting of Vancouver Island. It's available now. I believe it uh, came out Tuesday, October 10th. And, uh, Shannon, where can they, people find the book? Well, it's available in bookstores across Vancouver Island. It's been uh, selling out really quickly. Oh, that's like, great. It's kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's exceeded my expectations. So, but uh, if you can't find it in the bookstore on Vancouver Island, it's available on Amazon. That's great. Now, you have some events coming up to promote the book. Absolutely. In Victoria at Bolin Books, on October 23rd, it's at 7 o'clock at night that I'm doing a reading. They sell copies of the book as well. And then on that Friday, October 27th, I'm 
doing a reading and book launch at Vancouver Island University. And that's open to the public as well. It's not just for people that are, are associated with the campus. That's the actual launch. So there'll be like snacks and um, there'll be there are books available there as well and signing and I'll be doing answering questions and such as well. The following day on October 28th at noon at Chapters in Nanaimo. Those are the three uh, main ones that I'm doing in October. And those are the ones I'm trying to encourage people to go to because you know, what better time to hear a ghost story than in October? I don't know about you, but I, I like getting a little bit creeped out. So I'm hoping that some of these stories will, <laughs> you know, touch people in that way. Absolutely. I, I love I love a good ghost story. And I'll definitely be at your uh, at your event here at Bolin on the 23rd. So, and if our listeners are in Victoria, Thank make you. sure you come by, pick up a book and say hi. If folks want to get a hold of you, Shannon, how should they do that? Uh, the best way is through my website uh, at livinglibraryblog.com. I spell my name with one N in the middle, so it's S-H-A-N-O-N-S-I-N-N, and that's my Twitter handle. And if it's, if you were to do shannonsin.com or shannonsin.ca, either will do, redirect you to my Living Library blog site as well. So uh, those are the, the, the easiest ways. I also have a Facebook page uh, that could be found by Googling uh, my name and I'm on Instagram as well. All right. Well, the book again is The Haunting of Vancouver Island. You can find that anywhere fine books are sold. And the author is Shannon Zinn. Shannon, thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. This episode of the Ghost Story Guys has been brought to you in part by CoffeeCrew.com. Welcome back. Thanks again to Shannon for coming on the show. Uh, now his book, The Haunting of Vancouver Island, that's coming out from the same publishing house as your book, right? Th- Throbbing Wood or whatever? Oh, God, touch wood. That's not better. <laughs> You know, they listen to this show, right? Like, Tori, that lovely lady you kept referring to as the predator <laughs> when my book was coming out, she's Shannon's publicist too, so she will hear this. Right, but as long as I cover my heat signature, she can't say that. Oh, God, Brennan. Actually, I have a funny story about Tori. Okay, is she aware of it, or is this... <laughs> oh, no, she knows. Okay. So it's more of a story of me being a boob than anything. <laughs> oh, so like regular day at the office. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> What happened? So back in August, I was seeing a movie with some friends, and uh, I were sitting. It's those really nice, fancy theater se- uh, seats at the Capitol. Yes, the relaxed, laid back I ones. I love those. Me things. too. Oh, this is free advertisement for Capitol no. Six in Victoria. Go there. <laughs> they have recliners. Oh, it's wonderful. That's all you need to know. I saw Blade Runner twenty forty nine in those things. It's just like oh, it's like a hug. Yeah, it's like a two and a half hour long hug. However, if the movie's bad, you just drift off. Like was Silence? Was that the one we saw? I don't even remember. Remember there was that Martin Scorsese one about yes. the Jesuits? Oh, I slept through most of that, I think. Yeah, well, then you didn't miss anything. <laughs> Whatever you're dreaming about had to be better than that. <laughs> so anyway, you're at the theater. So we're at the theater, and I'm talking to my friends, and then all of a sudden I hear this this, you know, voice say, uh, oh, hi. Oh, hey, Brennan. And I, oh, who knows me here? Because, again, I, I people just don't say hi to me in the street because well, no. I'm unpleasant. And, and, and most... they don't want to be associated. Exactly. Right, yeah, 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 no, it makes I get perfect that. sense. So I turn and look, and there's a smiling young lady looking at me. And, well, I... Wait, you you didn't recognize her, did you? I did not. Oh, my God. She was the focus of your mockery for so long. How do you not remember that? I know. I, 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 like I remember when she said, it's Tori. And I'm like, oh, of course it is. Because I know Tori. Yeah. I could never forget Tori. But right. I just sort of blanked on the face. And... <laughs> We had a brief conversation about you and kind of uh-huh. turned back to the people we were with. And then... Um, How can there be another part of this story? <laughs> well, on our way out of the theater... Oh, my God. You forgot her again? Yes. <laughs> Did you sustain a head injury in the theater? <laughs> 
August was a bad month for me. Apparently. I, I was all over the place. Uh, and sometimes I'm just bad with faces. Oh, I, my God. I know. Oh, you know, okay, to be fair, though, Tori is very good at changing her look. Okay, fair because enough. Because I've gone to see her, and she looks a certain way, and then I go back another time, and she's like, completely different you so, heard it here Tori this is your fault to be fair <laughs> Ian said Ian's words she is a human chameleon no she just is really good at the kind the of predator doing a predator natural surrounding oh god I it can't believe I fed together. into your twisted theory it all comes together uh, so uh, no Tori if you're listening I am a dick and this is my formal <laughs> apology please don't hunt me through an urban hellscape the way you did Danny Glover what it's Predator 2. It's not important. Oh, so, geez, can we just get back to Shannon's book, please? We absolutely can. So, uh, like I said in the interview, I, I, I actually enjoyed how he cut through the bullshit on a lot of stories. Yeah, and also how he brought to light a lot of stories I didn't know. Uh, I mean, you just don't hear much from stories up island like around Campbell River and stuff. No, that's true. I mean, partially because I assume, you know, no one cares about Campbell River. <laughs> Sorry to all of our up island listeners. They don't have electricity up there yet. <laughs> no, they have electricity and have internet. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just gather around a telephone pole waiting for the crow to bring the, exactly. the weekly messages. Exactly. The owls from Hogwarts. <laughs> In fairness, my mom lived there for several years, so I'm familiar with Campbell River. Mm-hmm. And uh, You still don't like it. Oh, no, no. I. Oh, God, when she left there, I was so happy. <laughs> oh. Did I ever did I ever tell you the shadow person story I heard from Campbell River? No, I don't think you did. It's I mean it's not particularly long or dramatic. Okay, which is what she said. <laughs> I was gonna say it sounds like your love life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> uh, but I know a guy who was working on Quadra Island, uh, which is of course just off the coast of Campbell River. Right. And one night he caught the ferry back. I think it was the last ferry to Campbell River, and he was walking home, uh, you know, in the rain in the dark, which is the worst way to experience any walk. Yeah. Uh, particularly Campbell River. Right. You're likely to be murdered or, or just stabbed for fun. <laughs> uh, but uh, so he was walking home from uh, from the ferry and he was walking down 16th Ave sort of towards Walmart. And there's that one stretch of 16th Ave where there are – this forest on either side. Right. And he was saying that as he was walking, there was a car coming towards him. And in the headlights of that car, against the rain, he saw several shadow people run from one, from the trees on one side to the trees on the other. Oh, like, were they on the side he was on, like running towards him, or were they running No, away? They, were, they were just crossing the road, almost like Weird. they were completely unaware of him. Wow. They were just crossing the street. That's crazy. It really is, yeah. And I mean, I've I've never really experienced much in Campbell River personally, you yeah. know, when it, we used to go up and visit my mother and her partner. But I remember one time we took a friend up there, she was thinking about moving there, and I God, she didn't. <laughs> See, honestly, there are parts of Campbell River that are quite pretty. Yeah, there are. But I'm not really a big fan of the downtown. No. So we, we went through downtown, and uh, for those of you who don't know, Campbell River, I think I mentioned in the interview, but Campbell River is a small town about three three hours north of Victoria. And it's sort of the last m- town of any size before you kind of get to the wild part of the island. It is actually the true mid-island. Is it? Campbell River, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's they always say mid-island like it's Nanaimo. It's not. If you look at it, Campbell River is the halfway point. I know there is, it's interesting, because if you go north of the city on the road by the water. Right. I was in a car with with a few people, and we all experienced this simultaneously. And that once we start going up towards Gold River, there is a sense of pressure, right, pushing in at an angle, like you had less and less room. Yeah, I've actually been to Campbell River. I've spent the night in Campbell River, and it is there is something there. Yeah, it is a weird kind of spiritual, weird place. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So, anyways, that was I thought that was uh, interesting to hear his story from there, and then yeah, um, you know, sort of have. Uh, or just read his stories from there and then have that sort of that experience in my pocket. And on the subject of shadow people, have you ever been to the Camby Pub in the Squamble? I know of it, but I've never been there. I, I don't like drinking in places I can't walk home from. <laughs> you could walk home from the Camby. Yeah, and Galveston is walking distance if you have the time. <laughs> just tell the f***ing story. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> well, it's not a story, uh, but I know a few people who've seen, they call him the Hat Man at the Camby. Oh, really? I, I, we talked about him, of course, in the Shadow People episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One employee says uh, they saw him in the basement uh, and then heard running footsteps down there. And presumably they got the f*** out of there right away. <laughs> yes, and I was also told they brought a medium. And uh, at one point they said there were two or three spirits down in the basement, but that's the last I heard of it. Interesting. So the, the can be. Now, like I said, I've never I've never drank there. I know I, I've been to the bingo hall next door. <laughs> <laughs> Is to say that's on a Squamalt Road, right? I heard uh, Hatman stories from an apartment building on Gorge Road East. 
Oh. Yeah, and it's actually, I mean, it's it's a long drive because it's, what's well, about a 10-minute drive because you got to go around the Gorge Waterway. Yeah. But uh, as the crow flies, it's very, very close. Huh. Well, it makes sense because spirits really don't care about my yeah, and stuff. And shit, they just yeah. pass that stuff. Okay. So which uh, apartment was it? Um, I shouldn't say one which one specifically just because you know, I want people poking around right, there. Right, right, right. But it's not far from the Hojo on Gorge Road. Huh. Uh, and I don't have specifics aside from the sighting itself, but it sure makes me glad I don't live on that side of the water. <laughs> no, that's for sure. But you, you do live in James Bay. That's haunted enough for everybody. Yeah, true enough. <laughs> And there, there have also been vague rumblings of haunting at the Gorge Road Hospital, oh. but nothing concrete. You know, I've never been in that building. I have been in that building, and I totally have no trouble believing that. Oh, really? Um, it was a senior home for so, so, so long. Like, oh. it is essentially that now. Right, okay. Um, that, yeah, there's a lot of death around there. It's a very shadowy place. Right. Yeah, so that makes sense to me. Hmm. Uh, good to know it's a senior's place because I was thinking about going to check it out, but they would probably <laughs> look at me strange <laughs> if I'm wandering around an old folks' home. <laughs> Um, I've heard for, uh, I've heard stories about the old St. Joseph's hospital as well. That was sort of the, uh, it was across from St. Anne's Academy, kind of a sister building. Right. Um, but, uh, it's all apartments now, but apparently, yeah, there's definitely hauntings that happen there. I don't think I ever told you the story. I remember one time I was out hanging out with a friend. We were out for a walk. We were standing in front of, uh, between St. Joseph's and St. Anne's. Yeah. And it was, it wasn't late. It was like 11 o'clock. We're chatting. And all of a sudden this police SUV rolls up behind us and this, uh, officer leans out the window and says, hey, are you the guys who called the police? I said, no, we haven't called the police. And she said, well, have you seen anyone else come by here? We'd been standing there for, I want to say, half an hour. And I said, no, it's just us. I mean, I haven't noticed anyone. Like, what's what's going on? And she said, well, we had a report about a man and a woman in trouble in front of St. Anne's. But we were the only people there. Weird. So we sort of took that as a sign, you know. Time to go. <laughs> Time to go home. Yeah. They, get, they do get calls to St. Anne's because people think there's people in the building. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Why? Um, the ghosts, apparently, the, the nuns are still there, and, and um, they still make noise and rumble around. There's a whole, there's a chapter on it in my book. You'd know that if you read it. Uh, no, I read it. It was good. It was great. <laughs> was best book ever. Just reading the back and the front of it does not count as reading it. Disagree, but that's fine. <laughs> Victoria's I've... Most Haunted, available at all bookstores now. Yeah, well, but A Strange Little Place, available <laughs> everywhere fine books are sold. So much better. <laughs> they can't be that fine if they're selling yours. True enough. <laughs> I don't think there's many that many bookstores carrying anymore. <laughs> Certainly nowhere in Victoria. <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> I think I might have mentioned this on the episode about your book. I knew a guy who worked in, uh, he used to be in the Ministry of Advanced Education, which is in the right. uh, St. Anne's building. Yes, Billing. yes. And he used to have this issue. He used to have a lot of stuff, I mean, just little stuff, but you know, his chair would be on the other side of the room when he went back to his desk and there's no one around, you know? And it's not a wheelchair. Thing, things like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, nowadays, if, if I was in there, I would set up a webcam on my desk and just leave the computer running. Well, that, that seems to be a thing people try, but there, I, I almost think there's no point to video evidence anymore. Right. Because- You can fake so much. You can fake so much. No I agree, one's but at take least you would know. That's true. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, I would do it just for me. I don't, I don't care about if anybody else sees it or believes it. I just want to see. So, yes, yeah, so whether it was the spirits in the building or, or whatever, but uh, let's say we, we ended up going home and that was the end of it. Wow. But- um, it was uh, it was strange. Actually, speaking of strange, I don't think I ever told you. Well, there's two things. I never finished my story, as as I was told. I never finished my story oh, from the last. Oh, about episode. what you brought back from uh, uh, Trunk Hill. Trunk Hill. Yes, uh, and uh, my Tim Horton story. So I'll tell you the first thing. Please uh, regale me with your tales, oh great sage. <laughs> Pull up a chair. <laughs> well, in the beginning. <laughs> Please. But, uh, okay, so to finish the story about, about the thing I brought back from Tronquille, yeah, it seems to have resolved itself now, but uh, for about three days after I got home, I kept hearing a knocking sound Oh, okay. when I went places, and other people would hear it too. Right. So I remember the first time I was driving back to the island, and I heard it sound like a rock hitting the door. Right. And I thought, oh, it's just a rock hitting the door. Not a big deal. But then I heard it again. We, I, I was sitting on the couch with Nick. After I got home, and we heard it on the wall behind us. Oh wow! And it was like there was someone in the, the yeah. kitchen. So yeah. we got up, looked, and there's no one there. And then you would hear it like in the closet, yep. or on the closet door. Was it that rat? <laughs> the rat is gone. <laughs> oh good. But and then uh, we were stand- I was standing in the bedroom talking to her, and the closet door next to me actually we heard the knock and it moved. Oh yeah, the closet door actually moved. And um, again, we kind of thought, ah, you know, it's whatever. It, there are no- noises. But then we're, again, we're driving to breakfast one morning and we heard the knock on 
the car door. We thought, ah, oh, it's just a rock. A minute and a half later, a knock on the top of the car. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is not uncommon. That is actually one of the main reasons I never wanted to do ghost investigations. Um, I knew a guy who went on these ghost investigations strictly as a techie. He he didn't have any sensitivity to this kind of thing. He he would love to see some proof of something, but that was as far as it went. He was there to, you know, plug stuff in and get stuff running. And while he was there, a couple of the ladies who were on the team said to him, you know, whatever it is is really attached to you and um, is really intrigued by you. And he kind of was like, oh, okay, great. Thanks a lot. So he went home, and the leader of the ghost investigation team got a call from him about, I guess, about three days after the investigation. He's like, yeah, I need some help. And she's like, okay, what's going on? And he said, well, something keeps knocking on my windows to get in. Wh- whatever room I'm in, it's knocking on the window to get Yikes. in. Like, knock, knock, knock. And he said, it's happening all through the night. And he said, you know, I wouldn't be so freaked out, but I live on the sixth floor of a condo building. Oh. Like, so this is something that is definitely attached to me. And I, I don't have any idea what to do with it. Like, I can't sense anything. I can't. All I know is it keeps knocking to get in and it started to freak me out. No kidding. So they went over and, you know, saged or whatever they were going to do and, and took care of it. But yeah, no, see, that's always really kind of disturbed me, that sort of attachment thing. I'm not a fan. No, no kidding. And I, I it seems to have stopped. So Good. I don't know if it's. Gave up. Yeah, pretty much. This guy's <laughs> thick as a brick. There's just no point. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I don't know. And wow. then, um, of course, then there's my, my Tim Horton story. Tell me. One of the people who was a huge help to me writing A Strange Little Place, available everywhere, fine books are sold, <laughs> uh, was Susan Kincaid. She was a friend yeah. of my mom's, yeah. and she was just a huge help. Without her connecting me to people, her sort of, uh, some of her st- personal stories, yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have really, I wouldn't have finished, yeah. you know? And so every, every now and again, we'll meet up, but I hadn't seen her for two or three years, uh, maybe maybe two years. So we're there, you know, shooting the breeze at Tim Hortons, telling, you know, ghost stories, what's been happening in our lives ever since, you know, whatever. And then I'm partway through a story. We're talking about dreams in Revelstoke, you know, the second geography of Revelstoke I was talking about. yeah. When all of a sudden I felt really far away and I got this intense ringing in my left ear, Mm. really intense ringing. And it it just stopped me dead in my tracks as I was speaking. And all of a sudden I had this really strong urge to stop talking. And I kind of blanked and Susan said, are, are you okay? And I said, yeah, no, I'm just, uh, I felt funny for a second there. And I, I actually moved because I, when I'm sitting in a booth by myself, I tend to put my back against the back of the booth and put my legs up. So I did that. And all of a sudden I was like, I, it was like there was someone sitting there and I wow. wasn't supposed to be sitting there. Wow. And so I, I moved and I said to Susan, I said, yeah, I said, just felt kind of funny. And she said, paranormal funny. And I said, yeah. And she said, well, shortly after that happened to you, she said, I felt the pressure on my chest. And that's how she experiences oh. presence. Uh, so we kept talking for a couple of minutes, but my it was done. Like I, I just said, you know what? I really got. I'm going to go home because I just feel completely discombobulated. Like it was like someone scrambled it, up your brain. Like someone just scrambled yeah. my brain. Yeah. And um, she she said to me, she said, yeah, you know, you haven't been the same since uh, since you had since that happened. Wow. And so I said, I'm I'm just going to go. Well, when I got home. I felt just not great. I felt kind of dizzy. Right. So I went upstairs to use the washroom, and then I got a text from her. And she said, after you left, I got so dizzy, I couldn't ride my bike home. I had to walk my bike home. Wow. And as I was getting close to home, a voice popped in my head and said, you have to hurry up and get home and smudge yourself. Wow. So she did. And as soon as she had finished, the voice said, now now get a hold of Brennan and tell him to do the same. Wow. So when this message came in, I was standing right, happened to be just standing right next to the smudge stick I'd bought for use in Revelstoke. Right. And uh, I, so I did. And I felt, yeah, the dizziness went away. Holy cow. So I don't know. I mean, I, I asked someone and they said, oh, it's just, you know, part of your spiritual retinue or, you know, whatever. Or Tim Hortons is the true vortex of all evil. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> Once they started pre cooking their donuts. Right? Talk that's about the disappointment. End. That's the end. But yeah, so I don't know. Wow. I, I don't know what was going on there. I don't know what the story was, but we both experienced it and we both had these physical effects that manifested after we left each other. And in some ways it's a comfort when you experience it. Oh, sure. Else, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. well, yeah. otherwise, again, I'm hypochondriac. So, you right. know, I'm dying. I have a stroke. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was, it was just a bizarre. Wow. No idea what's going on. Weird. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, th- I think that's going to do it for us. Thanks for tuning in. Mm-hmm. Again, uh, thanks for to Shannon Sin for coming on. And uh, don't forget to check out his book, The Haunting of Vancouver Island, which is 
uh, now out, actually. I believe it's available for order on Amazon, and I'm sure the local bookstores are covered in copies. Yep. And, uh, of course, Shannon will be at Bolin Books at 7 o'clock on October 23rd to do a signing. I will be there, and uh, are you going to be there as well, or are you doing a ghost <laughs> Ian walk? Ian will be ghost walking. Ian yeah. is ghost walking. Ian has a nine-day stretch of ghost walks. Oh, Lord. And then a couple-day break, and then back into it till Halloween. So, oh, yeah. no, not for me. Uh, it's going to be brutal. I already know it's going to be brutal. So I'm just, just prepared for it. Just like a donkey, just head down, <laughs> push into the wind. Once Halloween's over, I think I may actually be able to have a life again. Nice. What a concept. You're I not, know. You're not going to know what to do with all the spare time. I Well, maybe I'll start my own ghost walk. I, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't want to do that. All right. So what else you got coming up? Uh, you've got your, by the time this airs, your reading will have been over? That's right. Friday the 13th. Uh, I have um, a literacy. Uh, there's going to be a literacy festival in Sydney, BC, not Australia. Um, and I'm helping out with that. So on the 20th of October, there's a fundraiser at the Shoal Center in Sydney. Okay. And then on the 30th of October, I'm going to be doing kind of a leading, kind of a reading ghost chat thing at the Hidden Gem um, Metaphysical Store in Langford. Right. And uh, they would really like it if people pre booked. You can get a hold of them at, I think it's the email address is findyourself at thehiddengem.ca. Okay, is that so on? Is, is the event on them. Facebook as well? Uh, the event will be on Facebook, and just if you Google "Hidden Gem Langford," you're golden. Right. Okay. Yeah. I will, and I will be there too. So if anyone wants to come and gaze upon my glorious visage, or oh my god, I don't know, get some kind of like twin, disease. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I am <laughs> disease free. Thank you. <laughs> Yay, clinics. <laughs> All right. Do you have anything going on, Brennan? Uh, you know, I don't actually. I had. Oh. Uh, I know, yeah, no, I had my interview with uh, UPRN, which was a lot of fun. Good. And actually, I had uh, a really nice conversation with Melanie afterwards on Facebook. She, she right. was listening to the stream, which was yep. very cool of her. So that's <laughs> it so far. Uh, of course, you know, you can always find my book, A Strange Little Place, oh. available everywhere fine books are sold. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I'm going to be at Ian's signing on, or Ian's reading on the 13th, but, uh, you know, this it is going to come too up late after by that. then. That's but fine. thanks for coming. And I, I no problem, Chief. <laughs> And I'll also be at Shannon's signing as well, just kind of hanging out and uh, providing moral support. And, uh, I'm sure he's grateful. Scoping out all the free tea. <laughs> Bring your own thermos. Yeah, just yeah. Fill it up. you got to figure it out. You understand. <laughs> so did we get any mail this week? We did, yeah. We had, of course, another email from Vinny, which is always great Love fun. the Vinny mail. Uh, and actually, Lori got back with her stories about Royal Roads. Yeah, that was awesome. That was. And what I was thinking is, uh, of course, our we have three episodes this month. And the third episode falls on Halloween. Ooh. Yes, exactly. And of course, we were talking about trying to do something, you know, with uh, maybe a guest, but it just didn't come together in time. And right. Uh, so, and with your schedule too, it makes it hard to kind of book around. So, what I was thinking is, we're going to do a listener ghost stories. Love it for episode thirty. Okay. So, sorry for episode twenty. Wow, <laughs> episode 30. 30, yeah, That's no. a while. For episode twenty on the thirty first. If you have any other ghost stories, send them in. We're, we've had yeah. some people submit them so far. We're gonna. We obviously will change. You know, names and things like this. Yeah. But if you want us to, if you are cool with your name being on there, let us know. Yeah, sure. That that works too. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we will be doing that. And again, I'm not sure when the record date will be, but you've got at least a week and a half to yeah. to get those stories in if you have more. So in addition to Lori's email, we had uh, – actually, we had this great email from Luke, and I, I have to respond to him because he's uh, – He seems really cool. He's really cool, like yeah. He's doing, Did yeah. a lot of great research for yeah. us. He was um, – he had some really interesting Wendigo stuff yeah. that he had – that I'd never heard. And then he did a lot of digging and found some other stuff. So Cool. And then Wendigo is a subject I'd love to revisit. So thanks again, Luke. That was really cool. Yeah, very cool. Uh, you exchanged emails with Rachel E., and mm-hmm. that sounds, seems like a lot of really interesting stuff there, which we'll probably include in the, the listener episode. Uh, thank you again, Rachel, for writing in. We also had uh, an email from Rin, who was uh, binged the first 17 episodes in three nights, which is pretty <laughs> sweet. I don't even know if I could do that. I sure couldn't. <laughs> I, 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 I get sick of hearing my voice by the end of the editing process, never mind actually listening to the episode again. I get sick of hearing your voice when we're recording. <laughs> 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 okay, well... Uh, it, <laughs> I'm going to pause this while I strangle the life from you. Just uh, one sec. Oh, just keep talking. I'll be dead soon. <laughs> you, oh! you bitch. <laughs> and finally, we had some more emails from uh, Cynthia, actually. we Her and I had a nice chat the other night. So, again, if you want to get a hold of us, uh, there's a Facebook page, Ghost Story Guys. Send us e- an email at ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. Yep. And... Um, a couple of people have asked about Twitter. We don't really use Twitter. We have an account, but that's really lousy way to get a hold of us. Twitter is a dead social medium. Just stop it with the Twitter. 
That's right. my opinion. Yep. That's a 44 year old man <laughs> prognosticating on the I'm future so of social media. Freaking hip. Yeah, that's exactly what Instagram's it is. where you need to be. I think you know you need new hips. Oh, <laughs> so yeah. So again, we'd love to hear from you. So please, mm-hmm. please write in. Uh, thanks as always to Pizanta Music for our for our theme song. Please, as always, rate and review us on iTunes, SoundCloud, yes. Stitcher, and all other places, and uh, it just helps bump the numbers. And, and share, 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 share. And thanks to everyone who's rated us so far. There are already some ratings on iTunes and SoundCloud and places cool. like this. So we, yeah, it's pretty cool. We appreciate it. And I think that's going to do it for us. So uh, we'll be back with another episode in two weeks. It'll be a story episode. It'll be fine. It will be. So make sure to write in. Until then, back into the darkness we go. That's how Ian ended up in jail. <laughs> I haven't colored it, co- color coded it for you, old yeller, so I don't know if. Uh, um, I can't read that. Okay, let's see if I can go a little bigger. <clears throat> Shut up. Strawberry kiwi. It doesn't taste like either of them. Of course not. It's just got this kind of bite to it. And, mm. Jesus <laughs> it's like hugging a little person. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I'm surprised we didn't hear more about that, if I'm honest. Me too. You know, maybe everyone just thought if we don't talk about it, it'll just go away. We'll never have to speak of it again. Or everyone agrees with me. You know, no. No, they don't. (laughs) If you can't feel it, it's a stranger. (laughs) (laughs) Ain't a crime if you don't get caught. Oh, please stop. Yeah, no, I'm not going to. I do not want to have to testify. (laughs) Again. (laughs) You just said you just argued the opposite point. I will argue every. I point. know you will, you <laughs> Dick. Yes, we will. <laughs> Brent gets last word. That's my line. That's my line. <laughs> you You're, mean more powerful and sultry? Uh, sure. Yeah. Your tombstone's just gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> did I not tell you? You did. I did. You did. That's some gratification, at least. <laughs> I'm glad you're happy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> really. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I can't keep shoveling it into your maw. I'm shocked you just got that size. Mm. I guess if you'd known how much you were going to enjoy it. I would have gotten the big one. Fair enough. Bring on the diabetes. <laughs> but anyway, so I smudged the place. and With her permission? No. <laughs> I, I just, just did it. Did she notice? Oh, I'm getting to that. Oh, sorry. So I smudged the place. Right. That's Yeah, yeah. And, then I, and I said this. I said, also, I shit on your bed. <laughs> Maybe she was insulted that you thought it needed smudging. Well, tough shit, because it did. I know, but usually you discuss that with the homeowner. Yeah, I, I, I specifically didn't, so it was <laughs> to avoid this conversation. Yeah, when I think of rap artists, you immediately come to yeah. mind. Notorious B.I.G. <laughs> Wait, has that been taken? Notorious P.I.G. <laughs> <laughs> Notorious B.L.O.W.M.E. <laughs> Notorious not likely. <laughs> <laughs> just repressed and he's like maybe well, i have a rich interior yeah. life <laughs> like a guru yeah 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 exactly like a really fucking boring stupid guru <laughs> oh and, oh no oh it's all gone i'd say you need a hug but no it's not happening <laughs> so when can i finally make a make no. it no one day